participants who are in the waiting room right now to enter the actual visual online room. So uh, the Climate Academy 2021 is jointly being organized by the Munich Re Foundation and United Nations University in collaboration with the UNFCCC, so the Climate Secretariat. My name is Christian Bartelt. I work for the Munich Re Foundation and um, resilience building as well as climate change adaptation is a core pillar of our work. And recently, two years ago, we started to focus on nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions is also the core topic of this year's Climate Academy. And today in the session A3, we are going to talk about nature-based solutions as enabler case studies from all over the world. We have selected six Climate Academy participants in a quite intense uh, application process, and they will give us further insights in their field work. We will talk about how nature-based solutions can enable sustainable development in urban areas. And the regional focus will be very varied. So we will have case studies from Latin America, but also from Africa and Asia. So I would like to thank our panelists in advance for the sure rich inputs. Some technical issues and uh, the agenda or the program for today, as said, we will have six presentations each 10 minutes, followed by two minutes of direct questions. And the rest of the time afterwards, which will be approximately 15 to 20 minutes, will be used for general Q&A. But this goes to the audience. Please feel free to also use the Q&A section, um, which you will find in your navigation bar. If you have a direct question to one of the panelists, just ask and um, the panelists are also happy to answer the questions in a written way in the Q&A section. In order to not lose too much time right now, I would like to shortly introduce our panel to you. Okay, that did not work. Sorry about that. Next slide. That again did not work. Sorry for that. It's always the same with the technical issues. And if you're working with more than one monitor. Why does it always start with the last slide? No, here we are. OK, sorry for that. So I already introduced myself. Uh, I work for the Munich Re Foundation, and um, I'm focusing on nature-based solutions for climate adaptation. And we have one or two projects in that field. Our first panelist uh, will be Ursula Santana Nobrega. She has a degree in architecture and city planning and a postgraduate degree in sustainable development and environmental management. Today, she works for the Administrative Council of Parks, Gardens, and Conservation Units of the Municipality of Sobral in Brazil. And about her work in Brazil, she will also talk in her presentation a little bit later. Our second speaker will be Dr. Stephen, um, Dr. Stephen Dico. He is a visiting assistant professor at the University of Memphis in the USA. And he holds a PhD in regional development planning from the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. He focuses on effective urban green space planning and management, and his insights will be guided by a case study from Kumasi Metropolis of Ghana. As a third speaker, we will hear from Patmi um, Rana Shinge. She is an environmental scientist with a keen interest in water management and climate change issues. She's pursuing her PhD right now at the University of Texas in urban planning and public policy. And she will focus on a case study from Sri Lanka. As a fourth speaker, we will have Dr. MD Moinul Asan. 
and uh, he is an assistant professor at the Department of Real Estate Development and Management in Ankara University in Turkey. He received also his PhD there from the Department of Political Science and Public Administration. His topic will be about water security in Ankara, Ankara City. And furthermore, we will have Dr. Lin Junji. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Nottingham in Ningbo, China. She has a background in urban studies and her interdisciplinary research focuses on urban environmental governance and sustainability transitions with a focus on case studies in China. And last but not least, we will hear from Katerina Rochelle. She's an international consultant, researcher and PhD candidate, a geographer and political scientist with more than 10 years of experience in international development, largely with the United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat. Right now, as said, she's doing her PhD at the U Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And she will talk about traveling solutions NBS in the African urban context. So I myself am very much looking forward to have this panel together. And um, having said that, I would like to hand over now directly to Ursula, who will start. Thank you very much. I will stop my presentation and Ursula, you can try to share your screen. And when you're talking, please also share your camera if possible. And you're still muted. Mm -hmm. well, good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here today. And thank you very much for every everybody who has been enabled, enabled us to have this event today. Well, my name is Ursula Nalbrega and I'm from Brazil. And today I'm going to talk about a very special project to, to us here in my town, which is the implementation process and the result of the filtering garden for the wetland located in the city of Sobral in Brazil. And uh, first, let me tell you how my work is related to the nature-based solution. I'm an architect in urban planning, and currently I'm pursuing a master's degree in geography. And also uh, my research and today my work as a director of park, garden, and conservation units. I, uh, I'm keeping, and one of my tasks is keeping the filtering garden of the Pajero School. Oops, sorry. And uh, the project is Ursula, located... I'm very sorry to interrupt, but there's somehow a strange noise. Um, maybe we try without the mic. Okay, it's better now. Sorry. We still hear the beeping noise. That's strange. In the test, it wasn't there. Uh, okay. Ursula, That's do you have a fan running in the background? Do you have a fan or some sort of blower running in the background? It's, uh, it's okay now? Okay. No, unfortunately not. Do you have a fan or a ventilator vent in the background uh, running? No? Uh, yeah. Okay. Then... No, not really. Maybe, Christian, we go ahead, but uh, yeah, because we tried to work on this, it did not improve. Okay now? now it's, I hardly can hear you now. It's very quiet now. And how about now? Now it's getting better. It's getting better? Okay. Um, do you think that I should start again? No, just uh, continue where you just were and try to speak up a little bit if possible because it's a bit quiet, but, uh, but it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, and as a director of uh, park, garden, and conservation units, one of my tasks is keeping the filtering gardens of the Pajos Creek here in the town. 
And the project is located in a middle-sized town named Sobrao. And Sobrao is located in the northeast uh, side of Brazil, in the state of Ceará. Sobrao population is around 200,000 and the completely area of the city is located in the Caatinga bioma. And the Caatinga bioma, it's a very singular and, uh, it's, and this bioma solely happens in Brazil. I'm telling you that also to say that the success of every project that we have been designing here is always related to how we consider all the characteristics that Caatinga has, such the seasonal rivers, the very adapted vegetation, and all the potentiality that the vegetation uh, has here. And also, uh, two natural elements uh, mark the city landscape. One of the mountains and the other one is the river, the Akaro rivers. And because that location between these two natural elements, Sobral has several streams and creeks. And also the city has a strong historical and economical connection with the water from the Akaro river. But even the Akaro River has provided a very important part of the research to the city development. The sanitation infrastructure did not keep up with the growth in demand, and the Akaro River became a polluted river in the three last decade. And unfortunately, this is not a problem just for Sobral. And today in Brazil, more than 1 million people do not have access to sanitation infrastructure. And that happened when we know and we have been proved that the length of sanitation is directly related to the infant mortality and the production of methane, one of the greenhouse gases. And because of that, uh, in Sobral, since 2017, we, we are implementing actions to change this reality. And one of the, them, two of them, the main important is the expansion of the traditional sewage and the construction of the natural wetlands, especially in the Pajaus Creek. And why we are doing that uh, in the Pajos Creek? Because the Pajo is one of the biggest polluters of the Akaro River. And here in this map, we can see the city and the Akaro River go on all the way to the city. And these colors things uh, is all the new infrastructure that we are implementing in the city. And the localization of the project is here in this side. This is where we have the uh, Pajos Creek. And, um, and just uh, telling more information about the future, the filter garden of Pajos Creek. The future, the filtering garden is a natural switch treatment system. The system uses just plants, stones, breaks, sand to treat the sewage. And the main goal of the project is expand the, the system, the, system uh, the sanitation system using no traditional system. It's also mitigate the effect of the irregular switch and connect in also uh, uh, trying to, uh, to reduce the emission of the methane by the biological process and also create, uh, clean up the Pajos Creek and the Akaro River. And doing all of that, creating a potential garden and with a low price and maintenance, in, with a, sorry, a low maintenance cost. And just give you more information about the project. Uh, we, uh, the dimension of the project is around 1,200 square meters, and it's go around 1.19 kilometers. It cost around $4,000, uh, and it has a direct impact on more than 50,000 people's life. Uh, there is also very, a very important technique information about the project that I want to share with you all. Here in Sobral, we have a 
lot of uh, difficult to maintain equipments during the high cost. And because that we do not use, we are not using mechanical pump to, to, uh, to bring the water into all the system. We are using just the gravity and the water goes from the high level into the low level, no using any mechanical system. This is a small diagram showing the system where we have the natural system going here and the building system going all in this small dot things around here. And uh, in this picture, we can see how the water, I cannot say that this is water, but how the apajos grow in the system. We, say, we call that as a sandbox. And this is how the water looks like. And this is the building wetland system and how it looks like. And this is the natural one. This is another picture from the top side. And this is the building system when we just plant the plants, how it looks like. And this is when they grow. We have many different colors of flowers colors. And this is another picture of the building system. And this is the natural system. This is how it looks like. It's important uh, to say that we have the building system and the natural system. This is how the Pajos create goings naturally. And also to create a connection between people and the plants, we identificate all the plants uh, for all the project. And even we, we are in the dry season, we have a garden full of uh, flowers. And this is one of the beautiful things about the project that we can have flowers and color in a really green uh, garden, even when we are in the dry season. And also the, the area becomes a source to food for many animals uh, that started to live there. It is in the center of this, the town, it's just impressed. And in this picture, you can show the power of the natural when we have like sewage in that side and what the plants can do when, with all this material, just making that looks beautiful and green. And this is how the system ends. This is the end of the system, it, how it looks like. It's very important to say that we can keep fish and aquatic and more sensitive aquatic waters in this area that we cannot keep in the beginning of the system. This is also very impressed. This is also very impressing. And it's important to say also that since 2021, we have been running tests to keep improving the water uh, as we introduce new plants in the system. So uh, I bring some results that we uh, kept from the from the test and we can see that even we have just 15% of the system yet uh, complete, uh, we, can, we could see that the redu a reduction of more than 50% of coliform, uh, for, for fecal coliform. And we saw that the oxygen com come from zero to 3.22. 24 and we have like we can with just 50 percent of the system implemented we see that the nitrogen comes to 13 to zero and also the project uh, was finished in 2019 and since then we are putting new plants and learning with plants and see how it all works and um just to give you more information uh, and telling you four important strategies that we use to develop the project. I could say that the first one is a technical team. We believe that and we create a technical team, a diverse, a diverse team that is really involved with the local uh, challenges. And also we work hard to do plans and projects before everything. And I can say that we could not do 
any of that without the political commitment. This is very important. And the financial support is also uh, fundamental to have the great result. But I would say the financial support uh, becomes easy when we have a technical team that works hard in plans and projects and a political commitment. And if I would say one more thing, I would say start to do something and always considering the systems around you, especially the nature, because we can find all solutions in the nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ursula. This was exactly on time in 10 minutes. The sound quality was perfect and also the presentation itself. I would have two or three questions right now. They are further in the Q&A section. So, um, but time-wise, I would like to hand over to Dr. Stephen Diku now. Um, maybe you find the time, Ursula, to answer one or two questions directly in the uh, Q&A section. And hopefully at the end of the presentations, we will have time to tackle some of the questions as well. But thank you very much. Sorry again to the audience for the technical issues. We didn't have those in the test run, but it's always the same. And I would now hand over to Steven. And uh, Ursula, I think you have to stop sharing your presentation so that Steven can start his presentation. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, it's working. All right, great. <clears throat> so hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Steven uh, Kofidiko, a visiting assistant professor uh, from the University of Memphis. And I want to express my gratitude to the 2021 Climate Academy organizers for the opportunity to share my research uh, that focuses on res residence awareness and prioritization of urban green spaces in the Kumasi metropolis. Uh, generally, uh, if you look at uh, the definition of urban green spaces, uh, within this context of my research, I define it in terms of all public and private urban greenery or vegetated, vegetated areas in urban areas. And urban green spaces offer numerous benefits. For instance, they help, uh, help urban areas mitigate climate change impacts through carbon sequestration. They also help to reduce the severity of urban heat island effects through cooling and shading. And in addition, urban green spaces uh, intercept rainfall uh, increase soil infiltration and delay uh, peak flows of stormwater runoff, thus helping to alleviate uh, the potential for urban flooding. Now, beyond uh, these uh, benefits, there are other socioeconomic benefits, as uh, you can see from the figure on your screen. Uh, because of this, uh, urban green spaces uh, are now recognized uh, by uh, international development organizations, including the United Nations, as fundamental for promoting sustainable cities and communities. Uh, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals 11 targets uh, seven, particularly emphasizes uh, increasing access to and availability of urban green spaces to achieve sustainable cities and communities. Uh, however, the rate of urbanization and its management in Africa presents tremendous challenges uh, promoting urban sustainability. Uh, compared to uh, other continents, Africa's urbanization rate of 3.6 percent between 2015 and 2020 uh, is the highest. Uh, indeed, uh, the factors shaping Africa's urbanization differ significantly from other regions and are characterized by poor planning, uh, unregulated growth, legacy of colonization, weak governance institutions, uh, and low economic prosperity. Uh, the consequences are that we are having unsustainable land development, widespread poverty, uh, rising unemployment, informality, uh, inadequate availability of and access to socioeconomic infrastructure. Another consequence which relates to the study that I'm doing, which is on green space, and this is from the Kumasi Metropolis where I did my study, is that uh, Africa's urbanization is uh, causing a decline in urban green spaces uh, on the continent. So for instance, uh, in the Kumasi Metropolis, uh, urban green spaces declined from 75.4% uh, 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 of the land area in 1986 to only 16.4% in 2014, with some recent studies suggesting further declines uh, uh, today. Apparently, uh, the decline in urban green spaces in the Kumasi metropolis has resulted in the loss of its historic accolade as the garden city of West Africa. Uh, hence, what we are seeing is that the urbanization processes in Africa and the desire to pursue urban sustainability amid widespread poverty and underdevelopment 
create tensions uh, uh, between uh, urban green spaces and de other development needs. Now, as evidence from one of the planets that I interviewed uh, on, uh, on your screen, uh, it is clear that residents may oppose efforts to plan for and invest in urban green space initiatives like parks when educational and uh, health facilities are inadequate uh, in uh, the city. And so uh, we needed, I needed to understand the perspective from residents in relation to uh, urban green spaces. And so what I did was to study 400 residents, uh, those, those who were 18 years and above uh, in the Kumasi metropolis. And I asked questions in relation to the awareness of urban green space benefits, their willingness to support urban uh, green space initiatives, their prioritization of urban green spaces, and also to understand what they considered as their development needs. So what was the result? Uh, first, 74% uh, of residents agreed that green, urban green spaces provide aesthetic and recreational uh, and leisure uh, functions. 97.8% also agree that uh, green spaces can help uh, regulate uh, microclimatic conditions. 98.5% uh, indicated that urban green spaces can improve air quality. 92.8% agree that uh, urban green spaces can absorb stormwater runoff, thereby helping to avoid flooding. 58.8% uh, said urban green spaces uh, provides opportunities for food protect, uh, production. And 97.3% indicated that urban green spaces provide opportunities for economic activities, such as informal, informal activities, as you see on your screen. Uh, given this fact, I also studied residents' willingness to support urban green space initiatives. Also, uh, in, I asked residents to, uh, in relation to whether they'll be willing to support urban green spaces. So 86.8% uh, said that they were willing to pay some form of user fees to maintain uh, uh, poor urban green spaces or the dilapidated urban green spaces within the Kumasi metropolis. 83% said they were willing to pay some form of uh, urban green space tax or fees to construct or develop new urban green spaces. 96% said they were willing to volunteer on urban green space initiatives. And overall, 97% uh, said uh, they will support the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly, which is a local government authority to develop urban green spaces within the Kumasi metropolis. Uh, overall, while residents were eager to support urban green space initiatives in the Kumasi metropolis, it was apparent uh, that uh, most residents considered them as a low priority. 13.6% uh, considered urban green spaces uh, to be high uh, priority. 25.8% uh, uh, considered urban green spaces to be a medium priority and majority, which is 59.5% considered urban green spaces uh, to be a low priority. Also, 71%, 73.1% uh, and 53.6% of residents who indicated that they would support and highly support the Kumasi Metropolitan Authority to develop urban green spaces indicated that urban green spaces was a low priority for them. Uh, here, uh, urban authorities therefore will need to demonstrate effective urban green space planning in order to harness and maximize residents' willingness to support urban green space initiatives in the Kumasi metropolis. Uh, so one reason for this low prioritization of urban green spaces uh, in the Kumasi metropolis has to do with the fact that residents do not consider urban green spaces as a need. Uh, so I asked residents about their needs and this is what I found. Uh, Community uh, or recreational center really comes closest to uh, green spaces as a development need, but that constituted only 3.8% of residents identified needs. The major needs related to jobs creation and business development, improved uh, uh, transportation, uh, sanitation and waste management, and uh, social amenities, primarily education and health facilities. And so it is evident that the main tensions that arise in relation to green space planning for sustainability relates to residents' development needs and priorities. Hence, given residents' low priority, residents' willingness uh, to support urban green space initiatives to address climate change impact are not guaranteed and not, not even by their high awareness of green space benefits. So what is the way forward if we want to increase uh, urban green spaces or promote nature-based strategies uh, in rapidly urbanizing uh, cities of the global south. 
Uh, so to enable uh, nature-based strategies through inc uh, by increasing urban green spaces in the Kumasi metropolis, co-benefits is imperative uh, uh, in urban planning and design, part particularly when thinking about when uh, thinking about uh, how uh, we increase or access to or availability of urban green spaces to promote uh, sustainability. Uh, for instance, school spaces in the Kumasi metropolis can be planned in such a way to so that's an example of a school compound uh, with the school park. These uh, spaces can be planned in such a way that we are able to increase the urban greenery uh, uh, as part of uh, increasing access to urban green spaces. And there are many such uh, spaces within urban areas. And these are potential sites for us to be able to increase the availability and access to urban green spaces within the commerce metropolis. However, this is dependent on uh, planners and so planners have a responsibility to play in identifying potential sites in urban areas for increasing urban green spaces and pursuing other development goals but this will be dependent on the capacity of urban planners in terms of the understanding of what co-benefits are and how they can use them or deploy them in development planning and design and so that's what i found from my research thank you and if you have any questions i'm available Thank you very much, Stephen. That was very much in time as well. Um, again, the invitation to the panelists to answer questions in the Q&A section, also in a written way. Um, I would have one for you, Stephen. Maybe I missed it in the presentation, but you said that the willingness to support of the residents is really huge and they really know what kind of benefits there are, including, for example, creation of jobs. Then when it comes to the priority, it was very low because they said they green uh, solutions does not do not focus on creating jobs, for example. How can you explain this discrepancy and how can you overcome that? So uh, the, the kinds of jobs that green spaces create for them per the understanding relates to how it provides them with an avenue to engage in their economic activity. So like the image that I showed you where the artisan was using the shade from the trees to engage in economic activities. Mm. That they appreciate because it is part of their everyday life. But to directly create jobs, uh, they had uh, uh, they were not very much attuned with that. Okay. In, they would rather uh, they rather they are rather interested in, for instance, job training, business development, providing credits, right. Uh, providing uh, alternative sources of livelihoods, places to engage in economic activities. These are what they were, these were the priorities that uh, they identified. For me, what I think is that, for instance, market centers are also places where we can green to allow uh, residents to engage in the economic activities. But because we have not communicated that clearly to residents, to just say that you want to construct a, a community park alone Without these connections, it becomes difficult difficult for them to appreciate when they, they need hospitals, when they need schools, when they need good roads, when they need drainage facilities. And so it is how we connect the two to help them know that, yes, we can achieve uh, some form of uh, educational spaces with the greenery uh, without necessarily compromising educational infrastructure would be critical okay. moving forward. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I love to have this discussion in a bit more depth after the next presentations, but now I would like to hand over to Padmi, who is third in our row. I hope she's here with us. Yes, Padmi, so please yeah. turn on your camera, your mic, and you can share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, can you hear me there? No, unfortunately not. There's again a strange noise. Just Talk a little bit and then we see. Oh, okay. Let me share, let me share this. Still, you have just some kind of. Uh, unfortunately, noise? we hardly can hear you. There's a, something like a, like you are talking underwater or something. It's very strange. Oh, really? I have not heard that before. <laughs> what about now? I have increased this now. No, still not. Uh, um... What should I do? Are you working with an external mic or external headset? So mm -hmm. maybe you just... It's, uh, it's internal. I, 
yesterday it was well i don't know what happened today uh let me try the different one yeah give me a second you want me to come back of course uh, Maybe uh, we just switch the order, pardon me, take your time. Okay, sure. um, we will just go to the next speaker. You can take your time and uh, we will just uh, switch the order. So I would now hand over to MD Moinu. And uh, pardon me, maybe you can stop, stop sharing your screen and we will directly hand over to MD Moinu. Oh, uh, if I take off the video, you still hear the uh, my sound very low, or still have yes, it? we still hear this quite fascinating water kind oh, of really? noise. It's really strange, it's really like you're talking from an aquarium or something. Oh no! Okay, sure. Okay, okay Manuel, the the floor is yours. You're still not in presenter mode. We can see okay. the... Welcome to my presentation and uh, uh, giving me opportunity to share my knowledge and experience about water security of Ankara city in Turkey. Moinul, sorry, could you start the uh, slide mode? We still see the um, surface of, of PowerPoint in yes. your case. Ah. Yeah, I perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, thank you all. And uh, the topic is about the water security of Ankara city in Turkey, existing challenges and uh, nature-based solution practices. And I am uh, Dr. Monul Hassan, as an, as an assistant professor in, at the Department of Real Estate Development and Management in Ankara University. So uh, normally we know that there, there are many forces uh, now in the world, especially climate change, pandemics, and other related forces. Uh, they're posing significant challenges on water and its security in the world. And uh, Ankara, the capital of Turkey, is located at the central Anatolia. Anatolian region are also posing significant challenges on water and its security, uh, especially in the la last two years. Uh, after uh, World War II, uh, Second World War, with the pace of industrialization, socioeconomic development, Ankara's population had grown to 286,000 plus population in 1950. And in 2014, it is 4.5 million plus. And in 2021, its population reached to more than 5.6 million population. And uh, in Ankara, it poses a cold semi-arid climate, has middle latitude, steep climate, snow winters, and hot and dry summers. Uh, it is one of the lowest uh, precipitating, uh, precipitating areas in Turkey. Uh, lack of snowy days in winter. There is a shortage of portable water, industrial water. Uh, so water management, heat waves, lack of green spaces, uh, also the challenges in Ankara city. So in this study, um, I used the both primary survey as well as secondary survey. And uh, I used primary survey through 13 key informant interviews, uh, four from Ankara Metropolitan Municipality, four, four from Ankara Water and Sewage Administration, and five from Estate Hydraulic Works uh, through a, a semi-structured questionnaire. And I also used the secondary survey from published on reports, repetitive organizations, uh, respect to uh, peer reviewed articles, books, and newspapers. This is the uh, topographic map of Ankara. Uh, you can see that the Ankara steep vegetation had, has characterized semi arid condition and uh, uh, gives, gives us serious and more, uh, merely uh, gives serious soils visible in Chankiri. Uh, this is Chankiri and uh, Bay Pazari district. This is the uh, existing estate and challenges in Ankara, if you have a look and the Evapopo Transportation Index in the last 12 months, especially from uh, December 9, 2020, uh, we can see that the, the precipitation records very low and it is a drier condition in Ankara. Uh, 
and if you have uh, see the ibavo trans uh, transpiration uh, anomalies uh, during the september and december 2020 uh, it sees that it is on the uh, average uh, long term mean uh, so it's also the evapotranspiration is rate is very low and uh, if you have a look about the ndvi uh, normalized vegetation uh, difference vegetation in index uh, it's also seems that around middle uh, term average uh, in ankara and if you have a look about the water uh, about the precipitation level during october october to july 2000 uh, october 2022 to july uh, 21 uh, it seems that the ankara is still a drier uh, area so their study represents that is, uh, there is a general increase in temperature trends while decreasing trends are observed in sakaria basin and the projection of the for the period of 2010 to uh, 2000 39, 2040 to 69 and 70 to 200, 2000 represents that represents that the precipitation will be decreased to 5.3, percent 14.46 percent, percent and 14.76 percent respectively. And however, the temperature will be increased in the above uh, reference period, 0.79 percent, 1.63 percent, and 2.60 percent respectively. So this is the, uh, the uh, today I uh, took this uh, data and amount of water reserve from uh, 2007 to 2021 in Ankara. You can see that in 2007 and eight, uh, there was a drought season uh, in uh, Ankara. And in 2014 also I found, and in 2028, uh, it's also the situation uh, looks, uh, though the population has increased a lot, but the water reservation uh, is still uh, low. Uh, so it was uh, there is a bulletin that uh, published by Ankara Mun Mun municipality uh, in January 2021 uh, 2021 nowadays uh, it written there that nowadays water occupancy rate uh, in the uh, barrage only 20.9 on percent and it seems that only 110 days water left uh, and per capita water consumption also increased uh, uh, it was in 2000, 2014 it was in 200 11 liter per day, now 250 liter per day due to pandemic and others. And water intrusion to dams in the first six months, uh, uh, I found that the, uh, in January, February, March, May, and June, all are negative uh, change. So intrusion is less than the last year in 2020, comparing to 2020. So only in April, it seems a little bit uh, better uh, because of uh, rain, rainfall. There are many dams in Ankara. Uh, dams comes uh, to water from uh, to, to Ankara, and uh, especially the Chamnidere Dam, which is the largest dam in Ankara. And it seems that the, if you have a look, that in 2018 it is very uh, down, and uh, in 2020 and 21 also is going down. So uh, uh, it's um, it is mass uh, Ankara is mass impacting on drought. So from findings from key, key informants interview, uh, 13, uh, they, are, uh, they are talked about the different issues about COVID-19, climate change, and other practices. Uh, so I found that the, some, they are talking that they have the, some rainwater harvesting uh, projects they started somewhere, but uh, not so wide scale. Uh, they, have, uh, they are also uh, from some underground giant reserv reservoir, uh, only few areas, not um, only few areas. Ankara is the first in municipality uh, they declared that the water su subscribers will not be cut off during pandemic, especially uh, I, we talked about the pandemic issues. That's why uh, they said that those who are poor people, if uh, they are using, uh, because they could not pay uh, for their subscription subscription uh, fee. That's why they, the government, uh, the municipality, they declared that the water subscribers subscribers will not be cut off during pandemic and they have started a campaign which is called Suver. this is the give water campaign they started even the online awareness program programs they started and accelerated roofful solutions and pipelines uh, pipe chains program during the lockdown and uh, if you have to look the existing measures uh, their existing measures are not enough to cope with the climate change as well as pandemic and they have lack of awareness program and integrated approach. Uh, so when I talked about uh, to them about the water supply and demand issues, uh, be more sustainable, responsive, are it is sustainable, responsive to the citizen, 
and that they uh, informed that, that they need intensive public awareness through uh, media needed. Major focus should be given on children and your uh, youngs because uh, they are also um, uh, consuming a lot there, but uh, maximum they are government uh, they are not focusing on children because that the children and young are the main part should be the one of the main part of the policy issues and others and awareness should be uh, taken and uh, they should develop the uh, Android based or modern um, technologies also. Even though when I talked with them and uh, they only few uh, maximum they don't know about the nature based or their you no know, nature based solutions but one or two respond uh, to respond they inform that they know a little bit about as uh, uh, in Ankara only uh, Chankaya municipality they are uh, they are uh, implementing a project uh, that I will uh, tell you later. Uh, about the nature based, but other municipalities they have also the some similar types of projects, but uh, not uh, directly to nature based uh, project, solutions projects. This is the nature based solution projects and infrastructure in Ankara. I found that there are six biological ponds in Chankaya, Ankara, and uh, the first biological pond located in Ahla Tilbel, uh, Atatur Park, uh, with, uh, with an area of 518 meter square and then they have implemented five, another five uh, biological ponds. So uh, some ponds are very big. For example, the Smith in Unu Park, uh, which is 1,495 1, square meter. So uh, they are also, uh, this, this six ponds uh, really uh, is one of the good cases uh, in Ankara. So uh, in other projects, I talked about the other, other projects, but uh, Turkey, uh, Resilient lands, landscape integration projects, uh, TULIP, uh, is aimed to improving livelihoods and resilient infrastructure services for rural communities uh, in the Bolaman River Basin, located in Eastern Black Sea region, and uh, uh, Chekerek River Basin in Antalya region. Uh, also, this uh, uh, project also have some focus on natural based solutions and. Uh, uh, that I told you before that the, the project that I uh, nature based, they have focused about the nature for cities. There was their own project, which is also European funded projects uh, is of the nature based related research and innovation in Europe. It is the first European project about nature based solutions for re renaturing cities and Ankara municipality because it is one of the large, uh, largest uh, municipality in Ankara around 1 million people around 1 million people is living in Ankara. So nature for cities projects, one of the important projects uh, for Ankara municipality, even though they are also uh, doing a good job. It, uh, it is started in 2018. And uh, when I'm talking about the hot uh, measures to overcome the situation of climate change with respect to water security, they said that the need uh, collaborative, uh, collective and collaborative movements with an, movement with an integrated approach because the, uh, the, uh, the natural, National Climate Change Action Plan should be detailed, audited, and reported on the basis of institutions. Central planning institutions should be uh, maintain their status quo. Natural based solution plans should be developed and uh, implemented and manage water by demand oriented, not by supply oriented. This type of measures they inform the key informant and measures taken from during the COVID-19 and uh, uh, besides water city, they said the central government should control and take necessary steps. It's true that the local government is moving, but uh, central government uh, should also move uh, uh, due to take necessary, uh, take necessary actions for, especially for policy issues. A movement or campaign with local government could be a fruitful action. All kinds of medical, uh, uh, hydrological or education should be taken and measures need to enter as healthy, more accessible and economic use of water. And uh, in conclusion, because only 10 minutes time, so in conclusion, I can say the authorities are taking a number of studies, plans, and programs, not uh, some programs on, not directly related to the nature based, but they have the economy, ecological based adaptation, or other nature for cities, or other types of actions. But a, a collaborative actions, a robust decision making approach should be taken. In Ankara, only 6.44% of municipal water is using for irrigation in green areas, but alternative sources of water, like gray water, should be used through a system of systems. In addition, it has seen that a significant amount of savings can be made at the rate of 69.40% in the municipal water consumed by domestic use in Ankara. The measures can, can be such as for um, 
yeah, renewal, renewal of networks, changes in prior tariff structures. Also, they did, Ankara Institute also did some changes in tariff structure in the past few months before. And uh, investments in maintenance mechanisms developed for rapid leak detection and others. More recommendations can be, I found the major recommendations here. A collaborative, collaborative action, a collaborative action is needed with the help of this organization like ASCII, uh, DSI uh, and Ankara Municipality and uh, developing strategic measures at the local level with the partition of local people, including child and youth and involving community people to raise awareness and need more green dialogue with stakeholders because the nature for cities projects, you know, they did some green dialogue. It was very effective. And uh, the, the informants, they inform me. And finally, the nature-based solution practice, not only for Chanka and uh, city, but also for their other cities, uh, which also uh, is expanding a lot and should need uh, the, to expand these practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moinul, for this very insightful presentation. It's a very complex topic here, which you presented, and I <laughs> imagine it was tough to, to keep within the, the 10 minutes. So I would have three, four further questions directly. But uh, again, given the time limits we have, I would like to postpone them to the end of the session. And I would like to give it a second try with Padmi. Padmi, are you still with us? Can you hear me now? Yeah, but not very well. Okay, let me try back. Uh, now it's better. Now it's better. Okay, I'll come back. Let me fix it again. Oh, now it's clear. Now it's clear. You can, if, if it stays like that, you can start your presentation. And please also switch on your camera. I don't know if you're still talking. Maybe it was just a glimpse yeah. of hope. Okay. Okay. Hi, good to see you. Can you see it? Yeah, and the sound quality is nice. Okay, good. Thank you. You have to start the presentation mode. So far, we see the surface of uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry about that uh, technical difficulties I had. So, my name is Padmina Singh. I'm at the, uh, the unit of uh, Texas at uh, Arlington in US, uh, so focusing on urban planning and public policy. So today, um, my uh, main focus is on uh, urban planning and how the green infrastructure can support the uh, environment. Uh, Sorry again to interrupt, but me somehow, I think you're covering the mic. Maybe you can hold it a little bit nearer to your mouth. What about now? And now it's better, yeah. So uh, my, uh, I will go very quickly. So uh, my main uh, interest in uh, green infrastructure for the uh, stormwater management and how it's going to help with the climate change. But, but for this one, uh, I was focusing on another study, how these um, urban trees and other nature-based solutions can support the uh, mitigation of climate change in uh, global south, uh, especially in Sri Lanka. So uh, simply, if we got the uh, global north and global south, you know, like uh, with this uh, planet line, uh, is divided the, the world to develop and uh, are not much developed. So that's why uh, global south is there. But in many global south, we still see uh, some kind of still behind of uh, going towards the uh, green infrastructure or the nature-based solution, because those countries, especially the nearby the tropics, they have um, evergreen uh, forest and the natural resources are really high, but because of so many economic issues and social issues, the uh, degradation of uh, all the uh, forest and the land use is really high. When compared to the other side, the uh, global north, now they are more both the uh, natural uh, resource management and native-based solution and green infrastructure. So that's why I want to emphasize in this study how that uh, global south uh, countries can also focus on the uh, 
infrastructure and especially like uh, nature based solutions to mitigate the climate change. So as we know, the climate, uh, the main one of the main issue I see even any country or the Sri Lanka, the rapid urbanization. When they do the rapid urbanization, rather they going with the uh, very planned or sustainable manner. They just um, go with the uh, whatever the land availability and just doing the um, uh, the planning, especially in countries like uh, Sri Lanka and the Global South, they don't focus much on the sustainability, but just they're doing the expansion of uh, development and the road systems and the housing systems, and that has much impact on the nature and the uh, environment by giving the uh, issues to the climate change more. So uh, I no need to go. Uh, uh, these things again and again. We know the heavy precipitation and the precipitation uh, pattern has increased. But here, only thing is, I want to emphasize this uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentration. Uh, this uh, graph. So here we can see uh, CO two is high and low, especially in the uh, summer and winter season. This is uh, from like uh, nine start with nineteen eighty two, almost like forty years now. So here the pattern we can see the carbon dioxide increasing, and then especially during the summertime, the carbon uh, dioxide concentration level is, um, in, the, in the area go down. That means this is really uh, uh, like indicator that trees can support uh, carbon sequestration, and it's, there's no doubt. So that's why we have to emphasize more on uh, like how the green and the trees to be like having more trees or more green or vegetation for the uh, environment, for the climate change uh, mitigation. So here, even we know this urbanization, we uh, altered the uh, water cycle also. So because of this water cycle, again, we have so many issues and the needless to say like uh, climate change impact is really increasing again and again. So this is how um, the trees um, gonna support. Like when you have no uh, vegetation, I mean the uh, urbanization or any impervious surfaces, the air uh, transpiration is very high and the runoff is very low. And then the uh, green um, groundwater infiltration is high. But when we having more urbanization, no more impervious surfaces, at the end it's having more like uh, more runoff rather than in like uh, transpiration or the uh, groundwater recharge. And that create more issues, not only the uh, climate change issues, but also like uh, related, like urban related urban floods and uh, many socioeconomic uh, problems. So now we have two options, either we go with the green infrastructure or the green uh, infrastructure, but we know in the green infrastructure, we have more benefits than the green we don't need any gray infrastructure, but mostly if we can go with the green infrastructure, we can have more benefits with the uh, to the environment and the long term. So here the uh, the green infrastructure means like the we having the practices mimicking the natural habitats and absorb or like especially the excess water or green soil is gonna uh, support the. Uh, Carbon dioxide sequestration and uh, having given the uh, urban uh, or not even urban habitat for the um, fauna and flora, and so then we having like a much high biodiversity and the pollinators and everybody like it's going to be much sustainable way. So here there are some different methods uh, we can uh, use as a green infrastructure method, like you know, humans uh, or the red garden bioretention cells, infiltration trenches, green roof, uh, plant above, green water housing system, and then urban uh, tree canopy. So those are the different types of covered forest. Either we can have vertical, uh, horizontal along the tree, uh, the street, or as agroforestry, or like uh, any, like there's so many different ways where we can uh, incorporate with our projects when we do the urban planning and the design. So here, uh, only a few uh, uh, pictures I took from the entrance of the global south, this is global north. So we know that trees uh, really will manage urban trees and give like very much benefits to the uh, environment and the society. So the uh, water management, 
which is remote and groundwater and uh, giving like this gives like a very scenic view with like support the mental and uh, physical health because it's going to reduce the air uh, quality like air pollution and increase air quality so that definitely is going to uh, support like uh, reduce the number of respiratory illness and uh, sometimes by reducing the uh, urban uh, flood it's going to reduce the uh, flood i mean what about diseases so also it's going to reduce the uh, air and that means it's going to have an economical background uh, uh, benefits so because in during the summer time in uh, over there or especially in the tropics when the heat is really high in the most of the days uh, trees uh, can give like cool the uh, environment and uh, so probably oxygen and the uh, sequestration carbon dioxide so with that uh, this is the green infrastructure uh, benefits i'm not going through the again but i'll just jump into the uh, my project those are the some uh, key environmental uh, and other sustainable development goals uh, which are uh, connected to the uh, Convention of Biological Diversity and the, uh, and the uh, Convention of Climate Change. We can see like uh, here for the biological diversity, we can see the 13 uh, SDGs and among that uh, 44 targets are really uh, interconnected. And then for the Convention on Climate Change, you can directly say the nine uh, SDGs and 30 targets at least like uh, my uh, is in intercooperated like i know uh, much and more than this are really uh, interconnected but for now at least we have to consider these things when you do the urban planning so my uh, with that background my uh, study is focused on sri lanka and i was basically select the uh, cities but for this study, I will only focus on uh, Colombo and Kandy, suburbs of Colombo and Kandy. So Colombo is the uh, capital of the country. 5.5 uh, uh, million people. Uh, Sorry, Patmi, could you again maybe take the, the mic a little bit higher? It's really hard to. Sorry. That. Okay. Uh, so you want me to go back again with this slide? No, just, just continue. Thank you. Okay, so uh, and the Kandy is the second uh, highest populated country. I mean the uh, city, and uh, but uh, also known as a very high uh, air uh, polluted country. I mean city because it's it's uh, in the valley. But Colombo, the air uh, pollution also high, but because of the uh, sea breeze, it's much uh, spread around. So uh, and then what I was did like we were like. Uh, I was like going through some, some uh, road networks, especially the ones they really built uh, recently. And uh, we were seeing like, like when you do the, uh, like uh, I did through the uh, Google Earth, when we do the Google Earth analysis, you can clearly see whatever the newly built or the newly expanded many major uh, transportation arteries, they don't have any green infrastructure or any nature-based solutions implanted like they just go like the street and right after that completely uh, concrete or paved street and then the wall or the next the uh, building to next to that so that's what i want to uh, bring attention here are some uh, pictures i think like you can see like there's not even like a space uh, for much for the parking but certain area you can have the all the tree lines and here uh, even they have spaces in between the lines and here they don't have much but what what i mean like here like if you see certain like miles away the kilometers or, kilo, or the miles like more than 10 20 kilometers if you drive through you don't see any of at least a tree like as a shade they just come at to the edge like they just put the road and the concrete Few years back, if you really see the Google uh, Google Earth images, and even I know by a certain uh, street um, personally. So I, when I was a child, uh, we used to see a lot of trees along the uh, road. But now with this expansion, we don't see much or at least any, unless like few trees here and there. So that I think is really needed to be addressed in here. 
because there's a high potential like even if you really think if you do the design of the native based solutions and the trees they can really nicely planted the trees here or they can have like a street trees side in the sideways or we can have rain water like rain gardens even like some kind of like a small uh, in trenches like for the, uh, when they are having a rain season there's like some areas highly flooded so they can have some kind of a detention or detention ponds along with the vegetation and uh, so that's what I studied in this study. It's really needed. So what I found, there's no street trees along many newly developed street uh, street trees, and even in their plans, I don't see they have a space or they're giving high priority for the uh, those uh, urban uh, urban urban trees or any other like a green infrastructure method. So uh, they will easily remove the trees for the development, but not plant. So uh, in previous uh, spaces have increased and really supporting this newly built environment, for the, like more supporting to the climate change, not supporting as a mitigation, but more like giving in the urban heat island effect or the urban flood and like uh, heat wave and other things. So that's uh, as a way forward, I think like nature-based designing and solutions are really important to, to implement in these uh, countries, in, especially in Sri Lanka, at, at least for the new ones, especially they are in an era of uh, development of roads, like highways to the primary roads, or general roads everywhere, but rather they just diminishing the uh, tree, uh, trees and the tree canopy in the country, they should, should somehow incorporate these trees uh, in the development process and they, go, they should go hand to hand for the sustainability of the uh, Thank you, and that's it for right now. Thank you, Patni, very, very much. Yes. Um, I apologize to the audience that some parts of the presentation were a bit unclear from the uh, sound quality. So As said, sorry. we had yesterday sessions. No worries, Patni, it's not your fault. Sometimes the technical uh, systems just uh, don't play along with, with our planning, but um, we will upload the presentation afterwards. Himanch already told that in the chat, so you will have a chance to have a look at this again. And uh, I would now like hand over to Lyun Jin Chi, uh, the assistant professor of the Department of Architecture. And let's hope that at least here, uh, the technical side will work out very well. And the floor is yours. Thank you. I just checking. Um, how's my sound? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, good. great. And also my slides. Okay, as well. Slides are visible. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is Lin Jinxie and I am uh, currently working in the University of Nottingham in both China. But actually in the past two years, I've been working as a postdoctoral researcher in the Durham University working on the EU Horizon 2020 Nature Vision project in which we, uh, me and my colleagues are mainly look at how nature-based solutions can address the various um, challenges in cities. Um, so now since I'm back in China, I'm shifting the focus to look at how nature-based solutions can transform urban, govern urban sustain sustainability governance in China. And that's the topic um, of my today's presentation. So I think for most of the panelists and also most of the audiences today that nature-based solutions is not an alien term and also the rise of nature-based solutions is quite obvious, especially when we are seeking the integrated approach or solutions for addressing the interlocking climate biodiversity challenges as well as to try to improve the human well-being. But I think uh, the very notion of nature-based solutions um, is quite, uh, I mean, the main feature of it is its inclusiveness and also its multifunctionality. And the inclusiveness of nature-based solutions mainly means that it, it encompasses various forms of interventions in different settings. So it covers various approaches of working with nature for addressing the various societal challenges that face our society today. So this diagram I'm showing here is actually um, 
a, a survey uh, conducted by the Nature Vision Project, um, looking at nearly 1,000 nature-based solutions in European cities. And here, as you can see, that um, nature-based solutions are actually associated to various urban settings. Um, and also they can be in different forms, such as uh, I think Padme has already touched upon some of them like urban forests, even wetlands, rivers, community gardens, et cetera, et cetera. And also because of its diverse forms, nature-based solutions are also um, uh, integrated or involved with multi-actor dynamics. And here also based on the survey that was conducted by Naturation, within the nearly 1000 cases, we found that 44% are managed by a hybrid governance, which means it has the involvement of both, both governments and also non-governmental bodies. And there are like 30% solely by governmental bodies and nearly 26.5% um, are managed by non-governmental bodies. And for those projects, um, private actors or private sectors, NGOs, civil society organizations, citizens or community groups, these are the most commonly involved. So I think this covers the inclusiveness of nature-based solutions. And in terms of the multifunctionality of it, it's that um, we all know that nature has a lot to offer, um, not only for people, but also for climate and also the, for nature itself. And here also based on the survey, we identified the various uh, benefits that nature-based solutions can provide in cities. For example, providing green space habitats for um, securing or protecting biodiversity. And also it can support urban regeneration, land use and urban development, et cetera, et cetera. I want to go through all this, but um, just the question is that uh, with the inclusiveness and also the multifunctionality of nature-based solutions, then um, how can it help to improve the urban sustainability in Chinese cities? Well, before looking into the potential or the possible ways forward, I think it's also important to understand a little bit how urban sustainability governance in China is today. So here, I uh, this slide summarizes some of the research that I have done in the past few years, looking at the eco cities, especially those eco developments in urban China. And here also, um, I summarize the main feature. So first these kind of eco developments are mainly led by the state, which means the government, as well as with the um, state-led organizations or state-owned enterprises, um, uh, governmental bodies like that. And these eco developments mainly relies on the formal policymaking and planning mechanisms, which favors technocratic solutions um, with the relatively low level of engagement of civil society. And because of that, there are um, a, some, a number of issues, for example, the lack of support from the local communities and residents. So in our, in our previous studies, we found that although some, some um, solar panel has been installed on the, on the rooftop of the house, but the local community or local systems will refuse to use them because they're concerned about the higher costs. And also this kind of um, lack of uh, engagement of the civil society can lead to other problems such as social spatial polarization, social exclusion, environmental gentrification, and ecological disruption, which is ironically through ecological development. And also, besides this late state led process, uh, eco development or sustainable governance in China shows the trend to favor or, or use the indicator systems. And these indicator systems is often sim simplifying the challenges or the goals to achieve sustainability. So uh, many of them are even set in the normal planning period, which lasts for five years or 10 years. And these short-term goals and targets often lead to the quick, but not necessarily sustainable solutions. For example, in the Chomi Eco Island that I focus on for my PhD studies, um, the local government set a very high target to increase the forest coverage rate on that island, which is basically a wetland, which is not naturally have those kinds of forests. And to meet that target, um, local officials will adopt this monoculture species planting, which 
um, as you can imagine, is not good for the local biodiversity. So the other issue of the current urban sustainable governance in China is the over-dependence on government subsidies, like these projects that are listed here, they are all initiated and funded by the government. And because of that, these initiatives are vulnerable to political and policy changes. So for example, in, for example, three years later, probably the, 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 the mayor of the city has changed and the project that he or she endorsed will gonna be suspended. So for all these kinds of issues, then the question would be how nature-based solutions can really transform urban sustainability governance in China. So um, this, I think, would need to go back to the concept of nature-based solutions as well. So nature-based solutions involves social, ecological, and also technical innovations. And the experimental nature of nature-based solutions means that different ways of thinking, doing, and organizing can be tested in real contexts, which might catalyze wider systematic change. So in China, um, ecological innovation and technical innovation, I think has been, have been carried out quite often through the government funded or led projects such as the sponge city or even low carbon city. But social or institutional innovation is currently relatively lacking. And I think this is why nature-based solutions can be a powerful catalyst for transforming um, the sustainability development and governance in China. And here I would like to introduce two cases to exemplify uh, the power or the, or the magic um, of nature-based solutions. So the first case is called the Green Cloud, which is located in Shenzhen. And Shenzhen, is the, is, Shenzhen represents the, the speedy urbanization in China, transforming from a fishing village into a metropolis. And Within that urbanization process, there are various urban villages left um, within the city. And these urban villages, they are categorized by dense living conditions, lack of green spaces, limited underground sewage systems. And you can imagine during the monsoon season in Shenzhen, which lasts for about six months in a year, and these communities can be vulnerable to floods. And the Nature Conservancy, um, along with other partners, launched this Green Cloud project, which is to transform an old building's rooftop into a living sponge. And I think this project is transformative. It is because that um, at the very beginning of it, um, when they trying to install this structure on the rooftop of that building, um, local residents, they filed the complaints to local government thinking that they are doing illegal construction here. And then the local governments, they send the officials coming here and then um, they will see that they, they will say that there's no such uh, guidelines or regulations in place to um, explain or to direct the green roof installation. But after this project with the nature, based, nature conservancy officers talking to the local governments and also talking to the local communities, they come to a consensus and then to update the build, uh, the, the, how is it, the building guidelines in the city of Shenzhen to take green roof into consideration. And I, I think this case actually think, uh, showcase how a, a non-governmental organization led process can actually transform the urban formal planning or guidance in the city. I can see that my time is running out. So I would just skip the case two and go to the final slides. So how to unlock the transformative potentials of nature-based solutions. And here I list two key points. First is value inclusion and diversity. This means that not only listening to the powerful actors, how they shape or how they frame the discourse and practices of nature-based solutions, but also attend to those uh, local knowledge as well as creating spaces for bottom up initiatives or even grassroots experimentations. And the second point is to embracing uncertainty because often we see the uncertainty of nature and nature-based solution as, as a barrier for their implementation. Comparing to great infrastructure, they are much more difficult to quantify their benefits and also to monitor their performance. But I think to turn it into an advantage for nature-based solutions is that we need to recognize that 
this is a dynamic process. Um, Nature-based solutions develop, development is not a one-off action, but a process of learning by doing. And we need to shift in from this certain means of planning or development to adaptive thinking. And through that process, I think nature-based solutions can exert or unleash its full potential. And I'm sorry about um, um, the delay, but yeah, and thank you very much. No need to worry about that. I think the program is very tight and six speakers for one panel are a bit ambitious. We admit that, but uh, unfortunately we don't have more time to spread the speakers for further sessions. So at last I would like to hand over to Katharina Rochelle and she will be our last speaker. I kindly ask the audience to maybe spend five to 10 more minutes afterwards so that we can have a very quick last round and of course, to listen to the full presentation of Katerina to give her the same chances as the others as well. So Katerina, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Just to confirm that you can see my screen and can hear me well and clear. Loud and clear, and the screen is also there, wonderful. Uh, great. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, thank you for giving me the chance to present today. And uh, this is my PhD topic, in fact, um, my research at the moment, I'm looking into how international non-state actors imagine and deploy nature-based solutions in the African urban context. Um, well, for Africa, the least urbanized con continent or the least urbanized region worldwide with only 40, around 40% 40 urban, but the highest growth rate of urban growth, NBS are highly relevant. The urban population in Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to almost triple until 2050 to 1.26 billion. With two thirds of this urban growth um, up to 2050, yet to move, uh, yet to move into urban space that is not yet built, African cities have only a very short window of opportunity to set long-term sustainable growth patterns. Um, at the same time, rapid unplanned urban expansion in Africa places pressure on natural resources, both in and around cities, exacerbating natural hazards and more generally degrading the natural environment. High levels of urban vulnerability among the continent's large and rapidly growing population are exacerbated by climate change effects. And this stresses the need for robust cost-effective action for the world's poorest nations. So NBS is uh, urban nature and ecosystem services in and around cities may be disproportionately important for African cities where low levels of employment and high poverty necessi necessitate an increased reliance on urban green infrastructure for the provision of water, fuel, and food production. So amidst the, the mounting social, economic, economic and ecological pressures, NBS therefore has the potential to contribute to a number of the SDGs. Um, this may be also one reason why it can be observed that international non-state actors seem to actively promote the concept and practice of NBS in African cities. Um, I, I find this in, it, in itself already very promising um, because of the many sustainability challenges, but very little is known at the moment about how, for whom, and to what ends, and with what kind of consequences NBS are being governed in urban Africa by such actors. So I'm looking at international actors um, or conceptualizing them as agents of policy transfers in my research who interpret, frame, package, and represent information about best policy practices. So in this, this case, nature-based solutions. And also they design and deploy programs and projects on the ground. Why am I looking at these actors? Because they're really key stakeholders in African urban governance. Uh, for example, they take on state-like fu state functions by providing schools, health centers, and so on. Um, so 
since they are really a key in African urban governance, um, I'm, I'm focusing on them and there seems to be a research gap into how they, they govern urban nature. So my research question is then how and for whom and to what ends NBS are being framed and deployed in urban Africa by international non-state actors. I'm looking at programs and projects by these actors um, for the last over the that started since the past 10 years. That is my time frame of um, uh, of document review. And to me, I found three distinct groups of actors that I'm looking at: donors and intergovernmental organizations, transnational municipal networks, and international oh, apologies for that, international NGOs and think tanks. Um, my methodology is a document review. I'm looking at project documents and project reports, websites um, and blogs. Uh, my data collection, I've, I'm doing it online. Um, but I've also done consultations with different international actors to make sure that I didn't overlook key, key planned and implemented projects. I should have mentioned already uh, upfront that NBS, we heard yesterday that it can be defined in many different ways and um, that it has a number of overlapping concepts. So I'm looking at deliberate interventions that seek to enhance, develop or protect nature to resolve urban sustainability challenges. Uh, just to give you a brief snapshots of the kind of act actors I've been talking about um, in the last slide. So the donors and intergovernmental organizations make the largest group so far, but my research is still ongoing. Then transnational municipal networks like ICLE and C40 and, and some of the NGOs and think tanks I've been looking at. But much more interesting, what did I actually find out so far? Um, so in terms of the framing patterns, um, I looked at the problem solution space and I found that dominant characteristics and justifications are really around flooding control and disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. We heard that also yesterday in the presentation by, um, by Mr. Sandholz, that flooding control seems to be really the dominant risk addressed. Um, and, and this is what I, also, what I also found in my research. Um, I found that concerns of biodiversity is mainly advanced by transnational municip municipal networks um, and that concerns about heat stress and climate change mitigation are nearly net yeah and almost not there in these kind of project documents while we also heard yesterday in the presentation that this is really one of the key issues that we are facing and are going to face even more in the future um, in terms of the co-benefits that are being presented or framed, I found that there's a lot of emphasis on sustainable livelihoods and food security, but also an emphasis on, on health in term, and recreational activities. The beneficiaries are not really defined in these documents very well. So it's uh, mostly they talk about the vulnerable population, but it's, it's rarely further defined of, of who these are and how they are, um, how they are defined. And often projects um, refer to the entire city population being the beneficiaries. This leads me to the urban settings. And I found that most of these projects um, are largely limited to jurisdictional boundaries, while of course natural hazards do not respect these jurisdictions these city boundaries. What I also found interesting is that these projects seem to focus on what I termed user, usual suspects. So there's Kigali in Rwanda, a couple of cities in, in Mozambique, Addis Ababa, Dar es Salaam, um, Lilongwe in Malawi, Freetown, Sierra Leone, Kisumu in Kenya, Kampala in Uganda. Um, I'm, yet to, to look into this further because I found it quite interesting what kind of um, 
justifications these these actors give on why do they choose these these cities mostly and uh, the justification is that they are very vulnerable to climate change but um um yeah i'm yet to find out what really um motivates the, the choice beyond this vulnerability um to find out what lends cities um to to these nbs projects in terms of nbs characteristics um well it's kind of it's very context specific there was really a mix of green infrastructures or urban parks or afforestation but also wetlands protection and rehabilitation i have to hurry on i see um and intergovernmental organizations and donors seem to have often a mix of green and gray infrastructure i wanted to show you um quickly something on the governance functions all of these actors seem to um, work on knowledge generation knowledge dissemination capacity building and developing policy legislation plans and strategies while um, donors and intergovernmental organizations have um, physical implementation as one of the core elements it seemed to me that transnational municipal networks have um, have funding uh, pilot projects as as one of the, the added ons on capacity building and plans and strategies. Um, quickly on the collaboration and participation, I found it a bit critical that there was scarce information on the level and depth of public participation of stakeholders, and that I didn't find any mentioning of local indigenous knowledge of, of nature in, in such in these documents. My last uh, thoughts on opportunities and challenges um as i said i find it um very promising that uh, these actors actively promote the concept but uh, potentially viable solutions should also should, yeah should be contextualized in a in an inclusive manner and i will look into that a bit more in depth into my ongoing research the challenges i think are uh, that uh, to work across jurisdictional boundaries in the multi-level governance context where i found very little evidence uh, so far from these projects and and how they actually upscale from only pilot projects in usual suspect cities um, and since i also didn't see any projects emerging in small to intermediate sized cities i believe mainstreaming there is also very key last but not least a lot of policies and plans are being developed but the implementation is really key and we need to overcome bottlenecks of financing um and and overcoming competing development priorities thank you very much thank you katarina for that nice presentation i think it was a good rounding up of the of the whole panel here because we here now saw a little bit the topic a little bit more from an umbrella perspective and what kind of actors are involved and what limitations are there um, there are still two or three questions in the Q&A section. Maybe Lin Jun and uh, Katerine, you can have a look at that. For the concluding round, um, I would like to ask a very simple question. Well, it sounds simple, but I think in the end, it's not to all panelists again. If you could give, give us just one word or one issue which hinders NBS from being implemented, because we heard in all presentation, presentations about the huge potentials which are there, the synergies which are there, also the often social components which are positively there. Why are NBS not being implemented on a larger scale? What is the biggest hurdle? So if you could just point out one word, what, what is the biggest hurdle in your opinion? And I would like to start with Stephen. I would say capacity. Capacity by whom? By the planners. By the planners. Okay. Yeah. So we need to do more capacity training with the planners then. Okay. Uh, maybe next, Ursula. I would say political commitment. Political commitment. Okay. So it's again with the political planners, more or less. Uh, next, Padmi. Uh, I think uh, policy and uh, pol political support. It's the same Most here. Okay, again, yeah. the political support. Then uh, let's go to MD Moinul. Uh, I think uh, finance. 
finance. finance. Yes, yes. Okay. Because, uh, if they have some projects or the financial support, then uh, the authority or local government authority or central authority can do some projects and do some uh, projects programs, even though they can include in the plans and policies later. Okay, thank you very much. Then Leon Jun. Um, there are so many so many barriers that I can think mm. of. I think um, in the Chinese context, I would say understanding the knowledge of nature-based solutions. By which actor? Or by all actors? By all actors, actually, mm. because uh, people might think, like I mentioned in the presentation, the nature-based solutions are very uncertain. Um, you don't know how it will perform and how much cost that will involve, things like that. So, oh. you know, I think knowledge is a key component here. It goes a little bit of the direction of capacity training by Stephen, but he directed it more or less at the policy makers. You are more or less in a general way. So all stakeholders involved in NBS need more knowledge about that. Okay, and last but not least, again, Katerina, your take on this question? I would say political will uh, combined with competing development priorities. Okay, so again, we are in the political dimension. I find that very interesting because um, I hope that we will have one or two further sessions where we'll, we'll talk about the um, actual... Um, and potential of NBS. So can they really solve a huge part of the problems we are facing? So the, the natural resources which are there, but concerning the uh, governmental, governmental part and the uh, policy dimension, I think we will have a very um, interesting session in about an hour and half and one and a half hours, um, which is supported by ECLEI, um, which was also men mentioned by Katerina, and they are supporting exactly the policymakers in local governments to introduce, uh, for example, nature-based solutions in urban planning. And the A4 session is called Capacity Building at the Local Level, Enterprise Evolution, Innovation, and Nature-Based Solutions. So, um, this was a perfect handing over to the next session. Um, thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you for your presentations. And as said also in the chat, we will make available the presentations if possible on a specific website. The link is provided in the chat. And I hope to see all of you, most of you in the session A4 in roughly one and a half hours. Thank you again to the panel. It was great to discuss with you and see your presentations. And again, sorry from our side as the organizers for the technical issues as said yesterday in the uh, mock-up run, we did not have that issues, but that happens. So thank you very much and have a nice afternoon and see you in A4 in one and a half hours. Thank you. <laughs>